Uh, can people hear me okay? Yes. So I'm Matthew Vale, I'm a consultant. Occasionally you'll do the work on the past radio first. And I'm also the company investigator on something called Mere Time, which is the Mere Cat What's Our Time in the Survey Project. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about stars and what stars and some of the fun things you can do with them and some of the fun things we've done with them with Meerkat. So you're all at very different levels from professors to um, graduates. So if I say anything you don't understand, if I was just sitting there and be a woman, please just drop your hand. Let's have a practice of that. Drop your hand. Audience participation. Uh, only average score there. Right. So I don't want you sitting there wondering what I'm saying. I speak with a very Australian accent, although my grandmother was South African, so maybe there's a little bit of South African in there. Um, so hopefully you can understand what I'm saying. Okay, so when we look up at the night sky, we see lots of stars. Does anybody know how many stars we can see? Maybe you can see more here because you're a higher altitude. Probably true. A million, a thousand. You can see the match on the clouds, and have millions of stars. So stars that you actually identify, the number is about 6,000. Okay? Does anybody know how long it takes light to travel from the sun to the earth? Yes, very good. Eight minutes for the plane. It's about 499 seconds, it's an astronomical unit. And we use the fact that light travels at a finite speed to do a lot of the work we do with pulsars. So when a pulsar is going around the star, when it's on the far side, it takes take longer for the light to arrive than when it's on the near side of the star. And we can use that to map the orbit of the system. We can also use the fact that the Earth is going around the sun, as it to for longer. So as the waves come in from the pulsar, they strike the Earth, and we can measure that time to about an accuracy of about a nanosecond, the radio data. And then, because the pulses are made up of random noise, we can actually get an arrival time on the very best pulsars to an accuracy of about 10 nanoseconds. So light, one light, I would travel at 300,000 kilometers a second. That's enough to go around the world seven and a half times. Let's just imagine I'm light and I'm traveling very quickly. In one nanosecond, I go about a foot, which is this ancient imperial measure of distance, which is about a foot in length. So it takes about one nanosecond to go a foot. So in pulsar timing, we just time when the pulses hit our telescope, and we work out where the telescope is in the universe, and then we, next time we look at the pulsar, we measure it again. And we can do all these amazing things, and I'm going to show you some of them today. So the nearest 6,000 stars or so are visible with our naked eye. So when you look at the star in a beautiful South African sky, and you guys have the same sky we do in Australia, Southern Cross, all that good stuff. Um, does anybody know how far away the stars are that you can see with your eye? Do you know how far up the sensor is? So you're going to have to speak about that. Four light years. Four light years? Yes, it's a bit over a parsec. We tend to use parsecs, which is about three light years. So it's nice and bright because it's nice and close. Does anybody know how far the furthest star is that we can see? I don't either, I'm freshman. But I do have a little application here that I'm going to use to show you, and this is where we're probably wrong. So. so these are actually the positions of all the stars that we can see with our eye, and the brightness of the star is roughly proportional to how bright it is. So I can make this thing spin, and it will make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. So hopefully you can see that. So the sun is where that yellow hexagon is, which is very convenient. And we're rotating 
the stars around it. And these are the actual distances to the stars that you can see with your eye. So some of them are very big, they're giant stars, they give off a lot of light. And you can see them out to several kiloparsecs. The galactic center in this diagram is represented by a blue sphere. And hopefully I can find it. And there it is. That's the galactic center. And if we were to go um, a bit far away, further away, um, it might be easier if I actually go to the galactic center. So this is the center of our galaxy, which is about 8,000 parsecs, or about 25,000 light years away. And this is kind of pathetic, but that's as far as we can see with our eye. It's not actually that far, it's a kiloparsec or two. So most of the stars we can see are actually quite close to the sun. Today we're going to look at some pulsars that are much further away than that, because we've got the amazing Meerkat telescope. So there's that little sphere of stars. They're the ones you see in the night sky. Now if we go to the pulsars, these are the pulsars you can see. And we'll get on to what a pulsar is in a minute. Here's that right to center again. And there is the, the sun. And using a telescope like Meerkat, you can actually discover pulsars all throughout the galaxy. So you can see they're in a disk. This is the Milky Way galaxy. So most pulsars are born in a disk. They get kicked out. Before they get very far, they die. So most of the ones we see are actually in a disk population. Some of them have weak magnetic fields and they live for a long time. And you can find them in the halo. And then luckily, because we're in the southern hemisphere, we can actually see pulsars in the, in the Magellanic cloud. So these are little satellite galaxies. These are the large cloud ones, and these are the small cloud ones. And there's almost like a southern cross of pulsars in the southern, in the small cloud, which is kind of nice. So let's go back to the tour. And this is why we're here. Uh, this is the wonderful Meerkat telescope. It comprises of 64 dishes. They're about 13 to 14 meters across, they're a little bit longer one way than the other. They're what's called an offset Gregorian, which means it's got a funny shape. And it's designed not to see much of the ground. So when you look at the sky, you don't get much reflection of the ground. And the ground is bad, because the ground is like 300 degrees Kelvin. But our receiver is like 18 degrees Kelvin. And so when we illuminate, when we look up at the sky, we don't want to see the nasty ground, because that gives us a lot of radio waves that are very hot. Uh, from the hot ground, we actually just want to see the beautiful sky. Um, so Meerkat has a lot of collecting area, it has very cold receivers, and it's the most sensitive radio telescope in the southern hemisphere. And I think it's the best radio telescope in the world. And we have the South African government and engineers and personnel to, to thank for it. So this is what's called the band pass. This is how much um, power we're receiving from the different radio frequencies. And up here on the right, this is what's called the L band. It goes from about 900 megahertz to 1700 megahertz. And you can see there's these little spikes sitting above the band box. Does anybody know what they are? Artifacts? Well, they're all real. Um, so, to some extent, they're not artifacts, but they've got nothing to do with radio astronomy or sources. So, on the left hand side here, around about 950 megahertz, that's actually cell phones. Who here has a cell phone? <laughs> so, unfortunately, a cell phone transmits at about half a watt, half a watt of energy. Comes out of your 
cell phone, and it transmits in a relatively small band, maybe 8 megahertz, and every time we turn those little bastards on, we get a signal that the near-cap telescope is capable of picking up. And so this stuff over here is not only cell phones in the neighbourhood, but near-cap, they can be cell phones hundreds of kilometres away, and they're also the base station. So when you have your mobile phone, it need, the telecom providers need to know where that telephone is. So unfortunately, oh, ah, excellent. Um, this is not the radio way, so we're good. <laughs> so every couple of minutes, your right here, your telephone sits in your pocket and it sends out a little um, signal and it tells the nearest cell phone tower I'm here in case anybody wants to ring me. So that it doesn't have to send phone calls all over the planet. So it does what's called registering with the cell phone. And it gives off these horrible little bursts of power which are big enough to light up your very expensive radio telescope. This thing's worth about three hundred million dollars. Your cell phone's worth quite a bit less than that. But uh, it's enough to destroy this part of the band. So we can't actually do any astronomy in this part of the band. It's gone. Does so anybody know what these things are? Over here. Well. What else can your cell phone do? It can tell you where you are on the planet. And it does that by GPS. And unfortunately, our nation's military establishments are such that every country wants to have their own GPS. So in the event of a war, we can all still work out where we are to help kill each other. <laughs> so there isn't just one GPS, there's all sorts of GPSs. The Russians have their own, the Chinese have their own, the Indians have their own, the Americans have their own. And these things are always transmitting, so you can pull out your phone and say, I'm in Poch, or I'm in Australia. And these are not so bright, but they're always around, because you always want to know where you are, which is kind of unfortunate. And then there's little blipsy, blippy things here, I'm not bad, I don't care, because they're nice and narrow. And then in the UHF band, which goes from about 500 megahertz to about 100, you can see we've got the same spikes, and that's because it's the same frequencies. So once again, that contributes. Now look at this pristine wilderness. It makes Kruger National Park look like a joke. <laughs> this is just the most beautiful radio spectrum somebody like me has ever seen. And this is attracting radio astronomers from around the world to your country because in Australia, this is full of handsets and digital TV channels, broadcasting rubbish. And here in South Africa, the government's declared that nobody's going to be allowed to have TV channels in this area near Mecca, and it's just wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. And then this is how much data we have to delete when we do a typical observation at 20 centimetres. So up is bad, and you can see near 940 megahertz, we're deleting the data all the time. And then where the GPS signals are, we also have to delete some data. And this is the future of radio astronomy, where we just wipe out everything because people want to know where they are and talk to their loved ones. I hope not. But at UHF, it's like really encouraging. So even if L band gets mute, it turns out that you can use about 90% of the data. But well, that's pretty good. Because the signal to noise ratio goes to square root of bandwidth. So if you're only using 10% of the bandwidth, you're only losing 5% of your signal to noise, you laugh. Alright, so this is what the Meerkat radio spectrum looks like. And there's a new one called S Band. My PhD advisor was a famous guy called Dick Manchester. And he used to hate it when you see my full band in your chest, because what do they mean? He would always say we should call this the 20 centimetre band. And this is the 70 centimetre band. But these numbers of names have been called have been dubbed um, by the South African uh, owners of the telescope, and so we graciously use them. But, um, 
we have a usage fraction that held band that's about 87%. That's, that's pretty good. There is a new receiver that goes from about 1700 megahertz to 3500, which is called S10. So, if you want to work out how good your telescope is, you need to know the correcting error. And then you can work out something called the gain of the telescope, which is the surface area times eta. The eta is the aperture efficiency. That's a, how many of the radio waves that hit your telescope actually get bounced into the receiver, the fraction. So it's just pi r squared times eta divided by twice Boltzmann's constant. 1.38 by 10 to the minus 23. You multiply it by 10 to the 26 because that's what density is. And you find that the gain in the near gap is about 0.05 degrees Kelvin per density. So if you've got one density source, your temperature of your receiver is raised by about 0.05 K. Um, and then you can work out the signal to noise. And it's the flux of the source times the gain so the brighter the flux, if you double the flux, you double the signal noise. If you have twice the collecting area, the gain doubles. You've got something here called the square root of B and B team. This is the square root of the bandwidth. So how much band you can use. So RFI, it's radio frequency interference is bad as it used to be. N P is the number of orthogonal polarizations, that's two. Because you've got two feeds. T is integration time. So the more observing time you have, the more science you can do. And then you divide that by the receiver temperature and then the sky temperature. So unfortunately, there's random noise due to Big Bang, which is about 3K. On top of that, there's thermal stuff happening in the galaxy. This is a nuisance for pulsar astronomers. But T rank plus T sky is an order 20 Kelvin. And then you get this bonus factor if you're a pulsar astronomer over you, continuum lackeys, where if you take W or W, because the signal is pulsed, you can do better than if it isn't. So you get this bonus factor. So if you look at a pulsar that's nice and narrow, um, if you take W, that's the period, take the width, is like um, divided by width. If that's 100, you get a factor of 10 bonus. It's never 100, but it's sometimes close to 100. Uh, so the square root of that gives you this bonus factor of 10. So now we're going to look at a quick example. So there's a pulsar called 1909 37.44, discovered by the famous Brian Jacobi, who no longer works in the field. It has a flux of about 2 millijanskis, and we know that because of Nick's wonderful website, we'll look at it in a minute. If we have a bandwidth of 775 megs and we look at it for 8 minutes, we know the period of the pulsar is 2.95 milliseconds. So this is a neutron star that has a beam that sweeps around the universe and every 2.95 milliseconds it does a whole rotation, which is pretty amazing. So I can't spin it 300 times a second, but if I was a neutron star, I would be able to. And we're going to learn a little bit later about how these things manage to spin, spin that fast. So we think neutron stars are about 20 kilometers in diameter, and this one in particular can spin about 330 times a second. And each time that beam goes past you, you go pulse, which is kind of cool. And the pulse is only 40 microseconds wide, or 0.04 milliseconds. So if you were to pull out your trusty calculators, thump him on these numbers, you would find you should get a signal to noise of about 2,000 if you look at this pulse star. So let's do that. So the flux is 2 millijanskis. Unfortunately, that's 2 by 10 to minus 3. If you were to pull out a calculator and do this, you would find you get 2,180. <coughs> so um, if we go to Nick, introduce yourself, Nick. Uh, Nick is the custodian of the pulsars.org.au website, which has the username near time and the password pulsars, which is not very secure. <laughs> <laughs> and one day that's going to stop working, but just at the moment we've been judged on our last four years of use of the instrument, and I have to give the reviewers a username and password, so that's what we chose. 
So if you look at um, this page, this is all the observations of 1909-1937-44, one of the most major cocktails known to mankind and womankind. Um, and this is the date it was observed. It was part of the Pulsar Timing Array, TA, 70 seconds we looked at before. I don't know what two is. I think that's the computer that was used. No, it's the beam number, it's boring number. The beam number is the computer number. Hmm? Is the what number? The computer number is the beam number. Oh, okay. Why are you got a computer beam number? Alright, this is how many gigs of bandwidth. This is something I don't know. 1024, it might be the number of pins. Well, three different channels. Yes. Uh, it was an L band. This is the number of pins. This is how many dishes we used. This is what's called the dispersion meter of the pulsar. And this is what the signal to noise was. And lo and behold, our simple calculation is of the same order what we see. So, drum roll. This is the pulse. That was very good. We had a drum roll. Most points. Right, so what we've got here, and I'm going to come over here. This is a pulse profile. So it's off, a beam hits us, and then a little bit later, over here, there's actually a little micro beam, and then it goes back again. Sometimes, some people will call this like an input pulse. And so the pulse comes on, it goes off, and the width of this is only about 40 microseconds. So if you blink, you miss it. What we actually do to create this profile is we build something called PTUs, which is just a com computer with a lot of computer graphics cards in it. And we sample the data at twice the bandwidth. So it's 856 megahertz. So we actually sample the data 1712 million times a second. Sounds like it's almost impossible. I've been an amazing engineer at Sorayo managed to do that. So they sampled each of the 64 telescopes um, data at 1700 million times a second on each polarization. And they sent it all into a big computer called a correlator, and it delays all the signals for the light travel time. So they know exactly where on Earth the telescopes are, and so they delay it so that each of the signals is what we call in phase. So we know we're looking at the pulsar over there. We actually know the position of the pulsar to better than a micro arc second, which is amazing. So we can line up all of the, the data. We add it together and we give it to a computer called PTUs, which was a programming guy by the works for us called Andrew Jameson. And he takes the data and he folds it at what's called the topocentric period of the pulsar. So we know how rapidly this pulsar is spinning, we know it's going around another black wall about once every day and a half, and we can adjust for all that, and we fold the dart, so the first pulse comes in, we stick it in a histogram of a thousand chemical channels. Whenever it's on, we get power, whenever it's off, we don't. And then the next lot of data comes in with another pulse, and we fold that onto the original 1024 bins, and we keep doing that for eight seconds, and we end up with a pulse profile. And then we add all of those together, and we get what's called the mean pulse profile. And you can see there's this red and blue. The blue is how much circular polarization is being generated by the pulsar, and the red is how much linear polarization there is, and the rest is unpolarized. And this is what's called the position angle. So what we think is that there's this intense magnetic field on the neutral star. It's spinning around, and as it sweeps by us, the radio waves that are being generated in the magnetosphere are spiraling around in such a way that the position angle of the polarized light sweeps past us. And if you were Michael Kramer, you would fit a model to this, and you would work out the angle between the magnetic axis and the line of sight to the observer. So you can actually start to study the magnetosphere of the neutron star, which is kind of wild. And because these radio waves are travelling through the galaxy, they're going through a magnetic field, and they do what's called Faraday rotation, and the plane of the polarization changes as a function of frequency. 
And you can actually use that to measure the magnetic field of the galaxy, which is pretty cool.
So the average density of the earth is about 6 grams per cc, the average density of water is 1. That's a rocky planet. And you can calculate the acceleration of um, particles at the surface of the earth by just taking gm on, on r squared, and you get 9.8 meters per second squared. We can do the same thing for neutron stars. So, most of what we're talking about is based on physical laws, and by using telescopes, Galileo was the first person to use a telescope to do sort of astrophysics, and he looked at Jupiter and saw that it had these moons. And so the moons, um, if I see them, if I put them against the center, ooh, the innermost moon goes faster than the outer moons, and Galileo used the moons to work out that work out if Jupiter has moons and the Earth has a moon, maybe they're the same, but the sun doesn't have moons, so maybe the sun is different and it's really at the center of the solar system. So Kepler took the observations of Tycho Brahe and he worked out Kepler's laws, hopefully some of you have done them. There's three of them. One is that the planets move in ellipses with the sun focus. So this also works with stars. So stars go around each other in ellipses, and the focus is their center of mass. They sweep out equal area at equal time. And the, um, it was amazing that he worked this out, but the time to go around once squared is proportional to the semi-major axis cubed. Newton um, came along and did this kind of properly with the law of gravitation and his um, laws of motion. And he wrote that the, the orbital period should be 2 pi a to the 3 upon 2 on the square root of g and plus n. So if you look at Mercury um, traveling around the sun, it actually goes in the elliptic orbit. And the eccentricity of the orbit, I think it's around about 2 or 0.3. And so it has times of the year that it's closer to the sun and times that it's further away. I think it takes 89 days to do an orbit. And this was the easiest of the planets to observe and work out its, its motion. If you look at how big the planets are, then you might be wondering how can we make a neutron star? Well, we're going to get on to that now. So this little silver ball here is the moon. And then there's Mars, and then the Earth, Jupiter, and not in the right order, but this is just to show you the relative sizes. So you can see that the Earth is kind of pathetic compared to Jupiter. But Jupiter is kind of pathetic compared to the Sun. So we can sort of spin this around. I don't think I can make it rotate. Um, and you can see that the Earth is kind of pathetic, and you can actually get a million Earths inside the Sun. The radius of the Sun is about 700,000 kilometers. The radius of the Earth is only 6,380 cubic the French. Um, so how is it that we can make a neutron star? Well, the Sun is actually quite a pathetic star on the grand scale of things. And if we were really close to the Sun and it was traveling towards Rigel, this is actually the relative size but the sun only looks comparable to rival because it's so close. If we can pull out of it, this is actually how big the sun is compared to rival. And rival you can see in the night star, but it's a great distance apart away. So there are stars like rival that are about 20 times bigger than the sun, and they can look at their lives very quickly, and they're basically a big chemical factory and they're converting hydrogen into other elements in their core. And although it might be hard to believe you could make a neutron star when you're living on the Earth, when you realise how big the Earth is compared to the Sun and how big the Sun is compared to Rigel, you can imagine that there's pretty extreme things happening at the cores of these stars. Now if we look at Rigel, it's about 20 times heavier than the Sun, its radius is about 80 times bigger. So the density is actually kind of pathetic. The temperature is 
21,000 Kelvin had some 6,000. And the amount of energy per uh, square meter goes as the temperature of the water power. So its luminosity is 100,000 times that of the sun. So even though it has 20 times as much fuel, it's burning at 100,000 times faster. So the big stars don't live very long at all. Its distance is about 863 light years, and Gaia has measured that to a measure precision. And it's only going to live for about 2 million years. Whereas our sun, which is a nice place to live, lives for 10,000 million years. So what's going on in the cores of stars? Well, we're basically building up a periodic table. So after the Big Bang, there was only 500 helium and a little bit of lithium. All these other elements come about because of stellar evolution. So the helium atoms um, get smashed together to form carbon, and you keep going until you get to iron. And then the star just becomes immersed in the, in the centre once it's um, converted all of its um, well, a reasonable amount of its material into iron. And so you have something that's about the size of the Earth. When it stops um, being able to combine, it stops giving off energy, so it collapses. That releases a lot of gravitational energy, and you can cause all of the um, iron atoms to actually condense their electrons and protons together to form neutrons. So we start off with hydrogen, we create helium and carbon, eventually we go up to iron. And we can get amazing compression. So if you were to build two iron atoms, which, and they were the size of a ping pong ball, their actual distance between each other, because of their electron crowds, would be a kilometre. So it's 25,000 times further um, the diameter of uh, the nucleus of an ion atom to the next ion atom. So you can imagine if you get rid of all the space between them, you can actually make something super dense. And so that's what happens at the end of the life of a big star. The pressure gets so intense that the core of electrons can no longer resist the protons in the nucleus and they form neutrons and you end up with a neutron star. So the neutron star was actually predicted by Oppenheimer, you might have seen the movie lately. Um, he was a very clever guy, often building bombs, he also theorised about neutron stars. And so neutron stars are about one and a half times the mass of the sun. They've got a radius of only about 10 kilometers, and this is being deduced by a satellite called NISA. Um, and Daniel might tell us about how uh, we're measuring the mass and radius of neutron stars using near cannon -like solar telescopes. And the density is amazing. It's 10 to the 9 tons per cubic centimeter. So it's a billion tons per cc. And if you work out the acceleration due to gravity, g, m, or r squared, the mass is about half a million Earth masses. So it's half a million times bigger. But the radius squared, instead of 6,380, it's 10. So the net effect of this, and I thought it was right, because I only wrote it for that, it's 200 billion times the acceleration on Earth. So if you could stand on a neutron star, you would get crushed. But if you could hold out a brick and drop it, it would accelerate super quickly. And in fact, if you were to sort of stand about this distance and throw bricks at a neutron star, each one would give off more energy than a atomic bomb, such as its ability to convert uh, gravitational potential energy into uh, normal energy. And in fact, if you can stick a star next to a neutron star and pour matter onto it, the energy density at the surface, for every square meter, you would get 10 to the fifth nuclear wars per meter squared per second, which is an amazing stat. I didn't do that. It draws an arrow at this point. So neutron stars are so dense that they're very close to being black holes. So black holes are objects where not even light can escape gravity. Light 
scarce from a growth escape the neutron star's gravity, but no, it's only about a factor of three smaller than, or sorry, bigger than a black hole. We're not actually going to talk about black holes today, but the neutron star is not far from it. In terms of what are the magnetic field strengths of stars, a typical star might have a magnetic field strength of about 100 gauss. Fortunately, that's almost exactly the same as a fridge magnet. So if you've ever pulled a magnet off the fridge, if you own a fridge, um, it's about 100 gauss. That's about the magnetic field of a protostar. And if you compress a protostar down to 10 kilometers from a radius of about a million kilometers, you can actually work out that the magnetic field would go up as the radius squared, and you'd end up with 10 to the 12 gauss. And so if you grab a magnet that's 10 to the 12 gauss and you try and spin it, it doesn't actually like it very much. It sort of powers in energy and it gives off a lot of what's called magnetic, magnetic dipole radiation. And that magnetic dipole radiation is what helps power the pulsar. So we're not supposed to use gauss, we're supposed to use SI units. So magnetic to the strength of a neutron star is about 10 to the 8 tesla. You can work out the voltage above the polar path of a neutron star. It's about 10 to the 12 volts. So if you're a poor little electron sitting in this um, magnetic field, you, it's like being in a massive particle accelerator. And you get accelerated along the magnetic field lines, you, you're going through a changing magnetic field, this causes the electron to spiral around, it gives off something called synchrotron radiation. I'm not a theorist, I just use pulsars as a tool. Um, but then we wave our hands and say that gives off radio waves. And you get this beam of radio emission that sweeps through the galaxy, and that's what we observe with, with Mirka. So if you work out how fast the pulsar spin when it's first born, if you take a star and it's rotating about once a month, the conservation of angular momentum means that as the star collapses, its moment of inertia gets a lot smaller, and if you conserve angular momentum, when it's first born, it should be spinning around about every 20 milliseconds. I've tried to draw something here going every 20 milliseconds, I'm not sure it works. Um, but if you're a ballerina and you leap in the air and you pull your arms in, you spin faster. So I need a brave volunteer to serve a man do. You're going to catch me if I fall. Very <laughs> <laughs> strong. <laughs> what about this young man here? Do you want to stand on your side? <laughs> Alright. So, if I'm spinning slowly and I leap in the air gracefully and bring my arms in, my angular velocity should increase. If this one goes wrong, you guys will take me over the lecture. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm going around spinning fast and I leap! And you saw I accelerate. <laughs> We'll do that all the time. If I have things in my hands that were heavy, it would work better. Alright, thank you. You can resume your seat. I'm feeling a bit dizzy. But at least I'm on a pulsar. Alright, so the, this 20 milliseconds number just happens to be about the speed of the fastest young pulsars we know of. So you can work out the power that a neutron star gives off. And it's a function of things like the speed of light, the magnetic field strength, the radius of its power, and the spin period to the minus four. And so if you stick in the typical numbers like 10 to the 12 gauss, etc., you actually get the crab pulsar, which is a real pulsar we're going to see in a minute, actually has enough energy well, it's more energy than 100,000 suns. And it's just a neutron star spinning with a magnetic field, which is kind of cool. Unfortunately, most pulsars are pretty boring, and their spin, their luminosity is less than the solar, um, solar luminosity. So if we look at the Earth and how fast things travel around it, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meters per second squared. The equatorial velocity <coughs> of the Earth is about half a kilometer per second. 
A satellite to remain in orbit has to go about 7 kilometers per second, and the escape velocity to get away from the Earth, you have to be going about 11 kilometers per second. If you look at the same numbers for a neutron star, they spin at around about 2,000 kilometers per second. To be in orbit, to stay in orbit, you have to go 141,000 kilometers per second. That's about half the speed of light. And to escape, you need to be going two-thirds of the speed of light. These numbers are actually a bit wrong because I haven't done the Lorentz factors that relativity implies. But it just shows you that these things are very relativistic objects. And because of that, they're kind of interesting to study. So pulsars were actually discovered in 1967 by Jocelyn and Bell. The slowest ones spin sort of tens of seconds, but the fastest one spins once every 1.4 milliseconds, so 700 times a second. The magnetic fields range anywhere from about 10 to the 8 to 10 to the 14 gauss. We think the radius is about 10 kilometers, but that's still something we're learning about. It's kind of hard to measure. There's various ones that have been had their masses measured, and you can do that pretty well with the UNICAP. There's about 3,500 known. The Chinese have put this massive telescope that's half a kilometer across for the past, and it's finding hundreds per year. Most of them live in our galaxy, um, and as I said, they're about three times bigger than the black hole. So this is a young Muslim girl, and she was like you guys, impression will be on graduate student. And they used to not use computers to do things, they used to use pen and paper. So they had something called a chart recorder, which had ink and had paper going underneath it. And the supervisor, Anthony Hewish, realized that quasars in the interplanetary medium actually twinkled. And he wanted to study how compact they were. So we actually removed from the radio telescope the integrated circuit that almost everybody had in their telescopes. And so they devised this thing that had high time resolution. Radio telescopes used to have these integrated circuits that would integrate the data to about 10 seconds, and they decided to get rid of that. And long and behold, they opened a new area of phase space. And Jocelyn was a very astute student, and she noticed that there was a bit of what she called scrub on her chart record. And then, a few minutes later, there was an interference, which looked a lot like it. But she noticed that this, this um, what she called a bit of scrub, was occurring about four minutes earlier every day. And that's the sidereal rate. That's how fast the Earth is spinning with respect to the stars. And so one might have crank up the chart recorder to help with the expense of all the paper. And they actually recorded this. This is the discovery of the first pulsar which has got a spin period of about one and a third seconds. And they call this Cambridge Pulsar 1919, when we used to name these our institutions. But they also called it LGM1, a little green man number one. So they thought maybe it's aliens. It's never aliens. And then they discovered one of the three of them and realized that either there are aliens everywhere or it wasn't anything to do with aliens. So these are historic pictures of, of the first records <coughs> of a pulsar, and her instrument is a far cry from the thing that samples the near-cat fiber 1712 million times a second. So you just had a pen and paper, so it's no surprise they didn't discover millisecond pulsars. So the other thing they discovered was that radio waves only travel at the speed of light in a vacuum, and the galaxy is full of electrons. So as the radio waves travel through the galaxy, they come across an electron, and because the light is an oscillating electrically magnetic field, it sees the electron go boom, and actually causes a delay. And a super energetic pulse radio wave, <laughs> going down very really fast, with a short wavelength, it has a lot of energy, and it sees an electron, just goes straight past it with a small delay. And the delay is proportional to 1 over the radio frequency squared. And so this is actually an observation of a millisecond pulsar. And this is how the light is delayed as a function of the frequency. So going from 550 megahertz up to 
1700, I think this is an observation of Tarks, the radio waves hit the telescope earliest at high frequencies, and then they sweep down to later times. And if we call the slope of this is related to the number of free electrons between us and the pulsar. So you can actually use pulsars to count how many electrons there are between you and the source. If you know the distance to the pulsar, then you can calculate the free electron function of the galaxy. And if you do that, you find out there's about one free electron for every 50 cc's in the galaxy. Between galaxies is about one kilometer. So you can actually use what's called this dispersion to count electrons in the galaxy. So this is how we think pulsars are in are. They're born with these high magnetic field strengths. They're super energetic when they first are born, they have a high magnetic field, they're spinning very rapidly. They give up lots of energy and they become a boring pulsar, which only spins about once a second. And then most of them die, and they're never seen again. They just float around the universe, the galaxy, you can never see them, and they're boring. What, sorry, what fraction do you think of actually did? I mean, how many, what fraction of the type of do we see? So we think maybe pulsars born about every 100 years in the galaxy, maybe a bit less these days, and um, <coughs> they live for maybe many years. And the galaxy is maybe 10 billion years old, so maybe 9,999 9, of every 10,000 dead. But if you're lucky, you have a low magnetic field and you can live a lot longer, even up to like a year, year. And if you're super lucky, if you have a companion star and do an amazing thing to you through that to learn about it. Because it's a source of great joy to every pulsar astronomer. So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that we can look at two stars going around each other. So we have a big star like Rigel and a little star like the Sun. And remarkably, they look exactly like Rigel and the Sun did earlier. So the big star is burning 10,000 times brighter than this star, it's blue. It's using up all of its hydrogen really, really fast. And what happens is, after only about 10 million years, it starts swelling up because it exhausts all the hydrogen in its core. It becomes what's called a red giant. And red giants actually become much, much bigger than the orbital separation of these two stars. So as it swells up, the material gets to a point where it would rather fall onto this star than stay bound to its own star. And you get something called mass transfer. So the big star donates some of its bodily fluids, if you like, to the little star. The little star becomes bigger, and you actually get a role reversal where this is the original star, and it's scooped up a lot of matter from its friend. And then this star here, is about to blow up and become a neutral star. So I could blow it up and we end up with a pulsar. So this is a pulsar. Oh, lost the pulsar. Mm -hmm. well, this is actually a really pretty demonstration because all the pulsars, when they first born, will escape. And they just drift off into the universe. And they just become a boring, solitary pulsar. So that's probably the norm. But if we're lucky, the gravity of this guy is enough to keep the other guy bound. And behold, the return of the, of the pulsar. We get a pulsar to a crowd, it's spinning really rapidly. It's in an eccentric orbit, and by the power listed in me, I can turn on the orbit. I can read the button. T for travel. Right. So what shape is the orbit going to be? There's a lady here who heard said something very softly. Yes. Ellipse. Yes, because they look cool as well. What about if it escaped? What shape would it be? Did somebody say hyperbolic? Very good. It would be a hyperbolic orbit. If it had just enough energy to escape, not anymore, it would be a parabola. And if it had, if it didn't lose any energy when it blew up, which wouldn't make much of an explosion, it would probably stay in the circular orbit. So this is what's called the conic section. So this guy here is in the elliptical orbit, and maybe it takes like a few years to go around its companion. 
And one of the neutron stars that we observed to meet that is called 1259 163, or 1302 163 if you're looking in the J2000 version. And it spins every 47 milliseconds, and every three and a half years it goes past its companion. And when it gets near the companion, the companion is actually what's called a B star, that's a very big star, with a disk of material, and it actually gets eclipsed because the poor radio waves can't get past the disk of material. We lose sight of it. And then one happy day it comes back, and we can actually use the magnetic field, sorry, we can use the polarization of the pulsar to infer things about how magnetic the material is around the sun. It becomes a gamma ray binary to when it's going on. It gives like gamma rays. And even TEV gamma rays is So eventually what happens is the good star, who is living his life much quietly, swells up and it starts spilling matter onto the neutron star. And you actually get an accretion disk around the neutron star. And the speed of material around the neutron star is going so rapidly and it's charged, it locks onto the field lines and it causes the neutron star to what's called spin up. This is called the resurrection scenario. And so you have this dead neutron star with this disk of material around it and it's exerting an accretion torque and depending on how long it lasts, it can either spin it up to like 20 hertz or all the way to 700 hertz. So it becomes what's called a recycled pulsar. And then this guy decides it's had enough, and it either just peters out and leaves behind a boring white wall, or it blows up and leaves behind a neutron star. So just before its life is about to end, these things are going around each other in a circular orbit. You have what's called a recycled pulsar. And then if it's not heavy enough to blow up, it just becomes a boring white wall. So you get what's called a ballistic and pulsar. The orbit is, is usually stupidly circular. And these things are really good for pulsar timing because they're spinning so rapidly that their pulse width is very narrow and you can measure their arrival times very accurately. If you become kind of lucky, the other one, the other pulsar the star blows up and you get two neutron stars going around each other. And in that case, you get a one that's recycled and going very quickly, and then you get another one that initially is very energetic, but soon starts spinning slowly because it gives off so much energy. And you end up with what's called a binary neutron star, or a BNS. And these things have an elliptical orbit. And they can go around each other in orbits that instead of being measured in years, are measured in hours. And the relative velocity can be up to 600 kilometers per second. And so the first one of these to be discovered was called 1913 plus 16, and the student who found it won the Nobel Prize for physics, which was nice, along with his supervisor, which didn't happen to quarrel just. So these things are going around each other so quickly that they're actually giving off gravitational waves which Einstein predicted that any two masses going around each other should have a finite quadrupole moment. And the time varying quadrupole moment means it should give off energy. That energy has to come from somewhere. It comes from the orbit. The two stars get closer and closer. And then they go around each other. And then just before they coalesce, they're actually going around each other a thousand times a second. So the orbital period is one millisecond, which is kind of incredible. And then they rip each other apart and you get a gamma ray boost. And a burst of gravitational waves, which is kind of nice. And you're enough with a boring white hole. You can no longer see. So if we just do some famous pulsars, this is the first pulsar. Relatively boring period of 1.33 seconds. Um, very low luminosity of just 0.006 solar luminosities, and it's about 16 million years old. The names of pulsars are determined by their position on the sky. So, O437 minus 4615, one of my favourites, um, comes up 4 hours and 37 minutes after Aries and is 47 degrees and 37 minutes south of the equator, and it's really good at the 
So, Pulsar surveys are done um, telescopes all around the world. It turns out you're much better off doing them in the southern hemisphere than the north, because we're basically the center of the galaxy. And Meerkat's being very successful at discovering the world. This is the telescope I was sort of trained on. It's called Parks in Australia, and it's found about half of the pulsars. This is the Mills Cross Telescope, um, which had found half the pulsars like 30 years earlier, including the, the Vila pulsar. So this is what the Vila pulsar looks like. It's the brightest pulsar. This is actually not correct. This is due to a processing error. But it has this single pulse that's 100% uh, linearly polarized. It's almost too bright for meerkat. The crab pulsar, you can actually see it's supernova in. It's in the northern hemisphere, but it's visible from South Africa. We actually know the very day that this star blew up, and it was recorded by Chinese astronomers in 1054 AD. Uh, this pulsar is very bright in gamma rays. This is what the crab pulse's pulse looks like. We think it's got two pulses, two beams, one that goes past you and gives off this beam, and then half a period later you get this, which is called the interpulse. Um, you can do relativity with pulsars. So the planet Mercury has this eccentricity of 0.2, and because of general relativity, its ellipse processes by a massive 43 arc seconds in 100 years. It's still amazing being a managed to measure. Um, but this was a mystery at the time when Einstein was developing his theory of relativity. And so the elliptical orbit every 100 years changes by 43 arc seconds, which is 43 divided by 36 hundredths of a degree. And you can measure it, which is kind of amazing. Um, anyway, general relativity predicts that this orbit changes by this much. It actually changes by a whole lot of reasons, but this is the unexplained bit. And so if I put on the, the orbit, the point of closest approach changes by this pathetic amount. So this angle here changes by 43 arc seconds every 100 years. That's pathetic. If you're a pulsar person, you can observe neutron stars going around each other. This is the famous 1913 plus 16. It goes around its friend every seven and three quarter hours. And the eccentricity is 0.617, so it's quite an elliptical orbit. And the rate at which the ellipse changes its orientation is 4.2 degrees a year, not 43 arc seconds a second. So these things are fantastic relativistic laboratories. And if you measure what's called omega dot, you can map away the system. And that was done many years ago when they realized that the neutron star you could see was 1.44 solar masses and it was containing 1.38. And if you've got two stars going over each other that fast, the orbit is giving off gravitational waves and it's causing it to shrink by a massive 3.1 millimeters per orbit. And so luckily, in a day, it shrinks by a centimetre. Over the course of several years, it shrinks by metres. And the time that it takes to get back to the nearest approach gets longer and longer. And all you have to do is grab a telescope like Meerkat and time when the pulsar hits the point of closest approach. And you can end up um, trying to confirm whether gravitational waves exist or not. So Einstein predicted that the amplitude of the gravitational wave would be given by this relation, and because the system is giving off gravitational <coughs> waves, and you're doing a thousand orbits a year, you can actually work out how many meters extra or less you've gone because the orbit's shrinking than otherwise. And you can grab your faint ray of telescope, or so your faint of telescope, and you can plot when the signal arrives compared to where it should have been. It wasn't shrinking. And the parabolic line here is the relativistic prediction. And the points here are what was measured by Joe Taylor and Joel Weisberg. And around about here, they were awarded the Nobel Prize for proving that gravitational waves existed. And they stopped observing. Took them away. 
So this was actually the impetus for us building LIGO, which is the gravitational wave detectors that are built in the US. They're amazingly sensitive. And if two neutron stars coalesce about 40 megaparsecs away, the distance between the mirrors will change by about one ten thousandth of a width of a proton. And if you fire a big enough laser beam at it, you can actually measure the changes in the position. And so that's me at LIGO, it's real. Um, you have to wear funny hats so the stuff in your hair doesn't destroy the, the clean vacuums and everything that they use. It's kind of fun. Um, anyway, this was the frequency of gravitational waves on the y-axis um, versus time when two neutron stars about 120 million light years away coalesced. And this um, was called the chirp was seen. And then one and a half seconds later, we had a burst of gamma rays from the Earth. And it, they looked in the error box, and there was a brand new star there about 12 hours later called a kilometer. So we're just going to finish up by showing you some applications of data from MEPAT. There's something called the double pulsar, which literally goes over the top of MEPAT every day. And my friend Michael Kramer uses the telescope to observe the system. It's a pretty fun system. It's got two pulsars going around each other. One of them is now dead. You don't see it anymore. It actually processed out of the line of sight. Um, but the pulsar A is alive and well. It spins every 22 milliseconds. And the two systems go around each other 10 times a day. Um, it has a fairly eccentric orbit. And in this system, you can see space time actually bend. So, this is my animator's impression of the system. It's got two neutron stars going around each other. I think it's 0.099 days to get around, so about 10% of a the day. They go around each other. And you can do funky things with the system. There's a, a healthy pulsar, we call that pulsar A. And then we've got pulsar B, which is this thing that takes 2.7 seconds to spin. <coughs> you can do that. Um, what happens is you can look at pulsar A as the radio waves go through the magnetosphere of pulsar B. So you can do an experiment. Sorry about the flashing lights. Cool, I mean, have an effort to pick them up here. Turn off the trailer, so maybe that'll be So what you can do is you can observe this pulsar. And when the pulsar B goes past A, you can watch the radio waves as they're traveling through the magnetic field of another neutron star, which I think is pretty mind-blowing. And so what I've done here is I've done an animator's simulation of what if there was a disk of material locked to the slow pulsar. And that disk of material is capable of absorbing the radio waves as they travel to Earth. So what happens is, twice per period, the radio waves can escape and get to the, the telescope. And then they get blocked. And then a little bit later, the disk goes past them and see radio waves again. And then it gets blocked again. And the pulsar travels by, and it only takes about 30 seconds to go to past. But during that 30 seconds, the slow pulsar is rotated 10 times, and the um, radio rate should be blocked about 20 times. So we can take near half data on this pulsar while it's doing it, and it's so amazingly sensitive, you can do things that nobody else can do. And so what this is, is this is a really poor, this is a poor, I'm sorry. This is N means how much power I get into the pulsar. Phase actually means time, and it's not more than one second, this is actually about 30 seconds. And this is how much energy we're receiving from the pulsar as it goes, as pulsar B goes in front of pulsar A. And you can see that it starts getting absorbed, and it gets absorbed more and more, and eventually it just goes back to normal. And so you can actually use this to determine how long it takes for pulsar B to spin, which is kind of incredible. And you can infer what the nature of the disk of material that's blocking the radiation is by how wide these um, eclipses are. And so one of my former students, Marcus Sloller, just submitted a paper on this. Um, 
and he's actually studying the opacity of the distal material that's um, blocking radiation from the apples. The other thing you can do is you can time when the pulse has arrived at the telescope, and you can pretend that relativity doesn't work. And if you do that, you see that there's a delay in when the pulses take to get to our telescope that is well described by this red line. And that red line is Einstein's prediction of how much space time should be compressed around a massive object. So you can actually see it takes about 100 microseconds longer for the radio waves to go past another massive body than um, if it wasn't there. So this is all in phase, this is one complete orbital phase, and there's an Einstein prediction of how much it should be delayed by having more measuring rods compressed around the material than there would otherwise be. And this thing here is the pulse shape of the double pulsar. And so we work out when that pulse arrives at our telescope and we can get this amazing confirmation of relativity. I'm almost finished. Millisecond pulsars, um, you'll be dealing with later in the talk. Uh, these things spin, the first one was every 1.5 milliseconds. They actually can turn on their donor star and destroy it. Some of them have funky companions uh, that are so compact the whole thing is fit inside the sun. Um, 1909, which is my favorite pulsar, you can measure its orbital electricity and it's 10 to minus 7. And so this means in the elliptical order, the difference between the semi-major axis and the semi-minor axis is only 3.7 microns. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay. And then well, another pulsar that's very bright and fantastic to communicate is 0437. And Daniel has done an amazing experiment about um, <coughs> how the, uh, <laughs> the radio waves from this, <coughs> the emission from this pulsar is causing a power shock. Too much of it is in the He's experimenting. <laughs> uh, there's other pulsars that have planets around them. Um, there's something called magnetars, which are very funny magnetic field pulsars. There's ones with all the other clusters. There's one of the cousins of pulsars, I think, called rats. Rotating radio transients. These are like a broken down pulsar that only emits once every few rotations. And then finally, there's fast radio bursts, which come from millions of times further away than uh, our pulsars that can be used to count the number of electrons in the universe. So, just to summarize, um, the future of this field is searching for gravitational waves from supermassive black hole binaries. If you have two supermassive black holes going around each other, they should perturb the nature of space-time. And the arrival times of the pulses should be correlated. I think a little bit later in the week you'll be doing that. And I guess my conclusion is that neutron stars are naturally occurring in laboratories. I'll ask if anybody has any questions.
go past our telescopes is now beaming in some other direction. So the double pulsar is no longer a double pulsar. And then the second question was, how do we sample the data? So you can buy these kind of expensive things which digitize data. So they actually digitize the voltage that is induced um, by the radiation. And the more money you pay, the faster you can sample your data. And at the Meerkat telescope, they can sample the data at what's called the Nyquist frequency, which is 1712 million times a second. So they actually digitize it, I think it's with 10 or 12 bits of precision. And then they send that data over an optical fiber. And then that data is digitally captured and passed to what's called the beamformer. And the beamformer delays the signals <coughs> so that they all would have arrived at the same time. And then that, the sum of that signal is what's passed to the pulsar processor. And it does this amazing thing called coherent dispersion, which takes the Fourier transform of all that data, multiplies it by a filter, or inverse filter, and Fourier transform back, and then you get the data as it was when it didn't go past the electrons. I can explain more later. Yes? Recently, the thing is called the white board. I really post this in the sense of the system of variety. Is it because or is it that they have some of the behavior of this kind of similar process? For example, they have some. Yeah, so the, recently people have started discovering that white dwarfs can give off beam radio emission. There's not very many cases known. And I don't know much about them, but Ryan might. What do you know about white dwarf pulsars? <laughs> uh, I guess I, I, when I think about them, I think about these new states called ultra-long period methods that have many causes of radio emission.
holding in, but the more um, positive effect there is of each sort of photon coming in. But in a radio telescope, you don't have enough signal to noise to detect individual photons. You're going to detect them because there's millions of them coming in. John Drew? How does the layout of the dish of the that equation? Because I know it's often said that the core of the meerkat is the whole machine that is around that. How does the distribution of the surface actually influence? Yeah, so unfortunately the ionosphere changes over the six kilometers of meerkat in such a way that your original solution that tells you that how many how much extra path length there is due to the ionosphere changes with time and as you get greedy and go for the bigger and bigger baselines to get more and more collecting area the more rapidly you dephase the telescope so um, unless 74 hours or so you go to a calibrator you don't you can't predict what the ionosphere is going to do with time although you can predict that at sunrise and sunset things go back so the more collecting area is not always good, but it's not always good. The more collecting is always better provided you can phase zero. And so how rapidly the ionosphere is changing hurts you. And you would never build a telescope under the South Atlantic for Mongolia, apart from back to the sink. Um, it would just be a really stupid place to put it. But we know phasing is going to be trouble for me and because we phase the array just in 10 minutes and you only have to do it with every 4 hours. You can yeah. probably get away with more, but you'd run the risk of you'd effectively lose more than you'd gain by sacrificing a few minutes to go to a calibre. Yeah. And in the future, I think... I'm oh, sorry. No, sorry, that's the question. When it gets bigger, then... Yeah, when it gets bigger, you're not going to do super clever things like notice there's a quasar in the beam and continually upgrade the calibration solution and not have to go to a calibrator at all. But you need good sensitivity to go to that. We're not a big fan of the dishes that are going to be like 30 kilometers away because they'll be phased probably at least five times faster than we would like. So we'll probably still use the compact.